I had a request about money circulation, how the people were get paid, how they would buy a car, maybe something like this. Uh, so there was a banking system. There was a bank and the people may just uh, deposit the, the money in the bank. Now, when they get paid at uh, their work, there were no such thing as credit cards, debit cards, and I don't remember having even seen a check. So people, they were get paid cash, cash, just the paper bill. Uh, usually there will be like 100 coins, the highest, higher paper bill. So you just get a small pack of cash and obviously the money will have be brought to the company and they just pay the people the same day and everybody goes back home with their cash. And because many people didn't have a, a personal car, they will need to get private uh, transportation, public transportation. So in that day, you usually the women will have the cash in their pocket, in their purse. But most of the times the woman at that day will just go with a colleague, a male colleague back home just to be sure. And I know I remember my mother was saying I will keep my hands on my purse, the whole transportation, the whole duration, because Unfortunately, Romania had a lot and um, less now, but had a lot of pickpocketing. So that was everybody knew that everybody was returning this day, perhaps at home with uh, quite a few money in, in the pocket. So uh, that was a little bit scary. But one interesting thing is that I do remember having this postman. This postman will just come to our block apartment and just uh, go to various apartments and bring a lot of money. I do not, I'm not sure if this was also salary, but I'm 100% sure that this was retirement, retirement money. So everybody who was retired would get their money at home unless they go, a day, there must be like a post office like this and get the money in person. But if you cannot move yourself to that place, you just receive your money at home by this postman. And I do remember this postman was just a regular person, a guy. He didn't have firearms or anything like this, but he will go to several apartments at once. So he would have had a big amount of money on him. He had, I do remember he had like this black leather purse, nothing, nothing fancy. It's just like a regular postman. Uh, so he would just go apartment from apartment. I'm not sure how many people of time, maybe 10 people. Or so, and I would guess he would have at least 20,000, 30,000 or so coins or on him. This is just my guess and estimation, a uh, big amount of money. And this guy, I don't know if he, he had, uh, taken karate classes or anything like this. I think he was really just a regular postman. And this is how it worked. So everybody, at, at least in Bucharest, but I guess in the countryside too, in the smaller city as well, uh, everybody would get the retirement money and maybe other other uh, resources for money, maybe the salary as well, uh, just by this postman. Um, it wasn't, Romania wasn't that, like I said, uh, there's a lot of stealing in companies and industries. So it's not exactly an honest country. We also had criminality but this is how it worked back then and I, I just remember i just cannot cannot imagine imagine something like this going on in new york city right now in 2022 and everybody knows knows who that guy is what he has in this in that big uh, luggage of him or whatever purse he has he knows the amount of money it's going to be impossible to do but this is how it goes uh, so again there were no credit cards there were no atm machines remember that uh, at least until 90s, we I have never seen a co personal computer or anything like that in companies, in private homes, nothing. I didn't know about that. Uh, so there were everything was uh, writing down on paper, everything from hospitals, from salaries, from whatever taxes you have to pay. Everything was writing down on paper. Uh, so, yeah, you, you always had this cash on you. And uh, my parents told me the day where uh, they went to, to uh, because they had to order in advance for their vehicle, for their car, and it would take uh, several years to get uh, the command done. Uh, they will just go, they, they uh, did uh, told us, they had this bag, plastic bag with bricks of money. And that's how they went and purchased, pay, actually paid for the car and took the car back home when the car was finished. On, out of the assembly line. So everything was paid with cash. 
cash every single place. Obviously, we had a different uh, amount of money. I think there were like paper bills for 10, maybe 20. I don't really remember, but I know there was 100 that was the highest. And then there was the, the coins, 5, 2, 1, and so on. So that's how the money would circulate. Uh, really, really was a cash country. And again, there was a um, bank that you can just bring your money there physically and just deposit your money. And also, uh, if you need to take back some money also in person, and they would just write down a paper. You have this amount of money in your bank account, and that was it. You have a small uh, note, like a notebook or something like this, a tiny notebook, and uh, just to write it down on it. That was it. Uh, speaking of notebooks, uh, you know those red notebooks, red, um, not sure what the name is, uh, that was that the communists had. Uh, so the party member had one of these red, uh, whatever you call it, with I don't even remember what was inside. It's just like an ID card, but it was red and it was specifically to show that you are part of a uh, communist party. And I do remember when I was in high school, uh, one day, I don't, maybe second year of high school or so, one day there is this guy coming to me and he's uh, asking me my name and I say, yeah, that's my name, and he, another student. And he tells me, you need to grab your communist uh, youth or something like this uh, red uh, red i call this notebook i don't know what's in english um and uh, as uh, he told me you need to go that day at that room to get your uh, communist whatever it is a red thing and uh, i didn't go actually i may have asked other friends did you get that one uh, they say no and i didn't go there and never got it so we see it wasn't there's there wasn't pressure on us the students children uh, it wasn't that much pressure to have this on parents as well, especially like, uh, except for those who were in the party. Those who were in the party had to have this. And also, from what I do remember, if you wanted to have a higher uh, function in your company, if you want to be a director or maybe a team chef or something like this, you had to be in the party and you had to get this red notebook thing. So that was like a restriction for them. But other than that, we weren't really forced to have this thing. I uh, just want to mention that I'm uh, preparing a video. Uh, I was saying this before, a video with images. I will show you some, just uh, obviously not going to film uh, to get you footage of everything in the history of communism, but just relevant images with transportation. We'll see people really, uh, um, buses park people, but also those huge lines and maybe some other things. And I'm really preparing a video about this uh, with images and footage. And also uh, one of the future videos is going to be how the communists would keep us in fear, because this is really, really important. Uh, what's the fear mechanism in the society? I did talk a little bit about uh, the Securitate stuff in the police, political police, but I just want to describe a little bit at all levels how the fear will work, why were we really afraid, and also uh, talk about a few dissidents. And something is interesting because there were also student dissidents. That that's actually it's, I find it funny basically because the political police could not find that guy who was actually a student, and they were really everything up in the hierarchy was completely frustrated to find someone who's posting. Uh, like text on uh, buildings like this against Ceausescu and uh, actually was a student and uh, everybody was raging from Ceausescu down and uh, they barely uh, and they had a lot of trouble to capture that guy. Uh, so this is about the money thing. Uh, also, it was illegal to own uh, foreign, uh, foreign uh, devices like uh, dollars or anything else like this. Uh, you would go to jail if, you, if the police will come back, uh, come to your home uh, to check your home and find five dollar bill you go to jail for this so that was really very very oppressive in a way um it, it's uh, uh, you see one of the main things in communist besides the uh, dictatorship part is that the economy doesn't work the communists in Romania spread over, uh, is that about uh, 30, 45 years, about 45 years. Uh, so obviously there is like a, 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 um, a steps, you no, know, there's periods. Some periods were better, other periods were worse. At the end, it was really worse. 
Uh, and one of the things that you need to understand is why everything in the economy, not everything, but a good part or most part of the economy is actually collapsing in communists. And this happened in every single communist country. I think one country that actually kind of had the less worst economy was Vietnam. Remember, Vietnam is still communist. That's because Vietnam had private property, not big companies, but just like small people could have a small restaurant, a small shop or something like this. Maybe that place did less worse, but all of the communist country, you can take Cuba, I'm not even mentioning North Korea, Russia, the Soviets, China, before the opening by um, whatever the president that opened the market was, all these were having collapsing economies. And the big question is, why is this happening? Like, you know, there is no competition. There is no private property. <clears throat> and this includes includes the land. So includes the farm farming. There is no pro private property. And I believe there is two reasons why this doesn't work. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. One of the reasons actually it's the kind of um, implication that the party has in the economy organization. The second reason is the worker. But before that, I just want to mention an event that that's, I don't think even all Romanians are aware of it. And that's, and I don't know how to describe it. It was, it could have been a turning point. You see Ceausescu came to power in 64 or 65, and rounded up. Um, and he lasted till late 89, let's say 90. So that's about 25 years. <clears throat> 25 years, the economy at the beginning was going decently for a communist country. But in the last 10 years, it really started to collapse. At the end, it was really, really damaged. Uh, we all uh, acknowledge that the economy was already bankrupt when Ceausescu was shot. Uh, but in... Eight, in 78, Ceausescu went to Carter in the United States. He paid Carter a visit. And the idea, just to uh, put this in the text, in the context, is that Ceausescu was kind of trying to be sort of independent from the Soviet uh, politics. He was dependent economically on them, but he tried to stay a little bit independent. And the United States did see in Ceausescu maybe a hope to crack the communist bloc. Maybe one of these countries that you can perhaps kind of establish maybe commercial, maybe little political contact, and that would be just kind of an opening into the communist bloc, in the middle of the communist bloc, because Ceausescu was basically, Romania was in between the Eastern Europe and the rest of the Soviets. And uh, that's why Ceausescu went to pay Carter a visit. America was like raving about this first communist leader to come to a democratic and capitalist country was unheard, really unheard. And um, I have to say that in Romania, I just, I'm, I'm not sure I was really too young, but I don't remember having seen that much in the news about this thing. Obviously there was something, but the population was not perhaps that much enthusiastic about this. They didn't have any hope about it, basically. Uh, but what happened in uh, in the United States uh, between Ceausescu and Carter is that at some point Ceausescu was with his wife up, up there. And at some point, Carter, during this visit, talks with Ceausescu and makes him a proposition, which was just mind blowing for the communist context. He did, I'm not very good in the economics and market and stuff like this, so I'm just reproducing what I uh, could find in, on the internet. He did propose to Ceausescu to list at least, at least some of the uh, companies in Romania, some of the industry companies, to list them at the Wall Street for and to pay uh, for this listing to Romania uh, the amount of that time that was uh, currency in 78, 100, I think it's 147, 48 uh, billion dollars. Make it 150 billion dollars to list the Romanian economy at the Wall Street stock. Maybe if someone is better with these technicalities can just let us know in, uh, if I'm making a mistake or something like this uh, in the comment section. But so he really openly proposed this to Ceausescu, this uh, investition in the Romanian economy by the United States. 
And this happened in 78. In 78, the Romanian economy was already starting to collapse because Ceausescu, uh, I'll explain this in a moment. Anyhow, let's see what happened in 78 at that point. I don't want to discuss about the possible outcome of this uh, if Ceausescu would have said yes. I just, I, I don't care. I'm not good at economics, uh, but it's just utopic because that didn't happen actually. Um, Ceausescu takes this proposition. He knows the economy is really bad, in bad shape, and especially is going to be even worse. And there's no other way to uh, correct the economy uh, direction at that point. He knows he has a lot of debt at the foreign banks, especially in the Western Europe. Uh, he took a lot of big, big loans. I'll explain this in a moment. He knows this is like unheard hope. He goes, he was, uh, I think he may have been uh, hosted maybe at the White House, not, perhaps not White House, maybe a hotel or something like this. He went back to his room and he was with his wife, Elena, and there were perhaps other people, that, but this history, we never knew about it, obviously in Romania, but this, this was uh, told us after the 90s by his brother, who was along with him in that trip. And so he brought his brother uh, heard the entire uh, the entire uh, communication discussion. So he would go back goes back that evening to his room with Elena, and the brother of Ceausescu explained that Ceausescu did not sleep the whole night. So he went didn't went to bed bed the whole night. He argued with Elena he, alone the two alone the couple alone in their room. He argued with Elena the entire night. This is what we are being told. The entire night, Ceausescu wants to take the deal. Elena is completely enraged against the deal. What the brother of Ceausescu says is that the Elena arguments were that that deal is like selling Romania to Americans. It's like a betrayal. That was her argument. The reality, what, why was Elena actually thinking? What was, because it was, it's hard to argue. Was it a betrayal? Was it selling Romania to Americans? I don't know. But I'm guessing, just guessing that she knew that the moment where Americans are going to have a certain amount of control over our economy, perhaps she instinctively, instinctively knew that there is a chance the Ceausescu will lose the power, political power. Perhaps her reaction was linked, uh, not mostly, but uh, was actually explained by the fact she was uh, perhaps afraid of losing the power, the political power. So this, the whole night, several hours at nighttime, instead of sleeping, <laughs> The whole night, the two argue until morning. This is what the brother of Ceausescu says. Until the morning, she is... I imagine this is hours of discussion in, in between a couple. So this is a couple decision over an entire country. This is, this is what dictatorship is, basically, right? There is no other counselor, no other uh, person from the economy uh, with his suggestions. The two are really... Uh, splitting the apple. They are just doing a food in the kitchen between them and they are just deciding the whole country. And uh, I, I just cannot imagine what the, they have talked for so many hours, the, the other arguments and so on and so on. In the end, and this is one of the realities of that regime, it's Elena who won. And I guess oftentimes it happens like this in couples, right? In the end, you are like, oh, I just, I just want this to be finished. Okay, do it your own way. You know, that's the man guy in the couple that would perhaps oftentimes say like this. Especially maybe you are also, also thinking of the future, uh, the following weeks, perhaps you are going to have a little bit of a dark uh, gray day. So you don't really want that, right? In your couple. So... Uh, that's how it all ended with uh, Ceausescu basically rejecting that proposition. And Carter actually did repeat the proposition later on, I don't, maybe another visit or so, and Ceausescu again said, no, we won't uh, accept the deal. Uh, but that deal, 
I don't want just from an economy point of view, perhaps, perhaps it would have changed a lot of things in Romania, uh, but also maybe would have had other political consequences. Uh, so yeah, this this is um, it, it shows you uh, at some point that it's not always you see a, a dictatorship is not always um, like maybe like we see in the movies. It, there is always always a very very human side of it. The people that are dictators, uh, just like Putin right away uh, right now, they they do have a kind of life for, for themselves and the judgment. So there's always a human side of this, not necessarily a good side of it, but there is also always something like this. Um, I was saying that uh, at that point in time, Romania economy was really bad. Uh, what happened is that, you see, uh, Ceausescu had this idea of the uh, social development, especially if you want uh, buildings, block apartments, which he did a lot, a lot of them. Also, he did destroy a lot of villages and uh, there were all other things, ethnical uh, kind of cleansing that he did with other ethnicities. Uh, but um, he had this vision of the society and also vision of the economy. And he basically had the, the entire Romanian economy. Obviously, there were specialists, right? There were like people who were studying economics in the universities and there were counselors for him. But he would take all these people, let's say there was a very smart uh, economic guy that would try to suggest him do like this with this industry or with these loans and so on and so on. He would listen to them, but in the very end, it was always his own decision. And also he had this idea in his mind, I was saying in some uh, other video, that he view the entire country just like a company, just like his own business. The employees were the uh, citizen, the company was the country. So he really got into all details of the economy and many other things in society. So he would take the advice, but in the end, it was always, always his decision, even sometimes in very, very small details in the factories, which I'll maybe give you in a few examples at some point. So at the, at the bigger, bigger picture, the entire economy that he inherited in 64, it was his vision of things. And you see, you can be a genius. Maybe you are, I don't know, Leonardo da Vinci or something like this, or some other historical genius. You can do good, but you can also fail. You know, there are big uh, companies, um, owners that did build up companies to very high levels, but there are always, always people who actually fail to do the same thing. So maybe the guy is a genius, but you are not sure you are going to get it right. And in my opinion, he really failed. There's always the context of the type of economy, but the fact that he had such a hand over m most of the economy, but also over many details, uh, this is what perhaps caused the biggest uh, economic crash in Romania. And uh, what he actually did in the maybe first years of his dictatorship is that, is that he took big loans from the Western Europe, Western banks in foreign currency. He took a lot of loans um, and he built the country with those loans because the country wasn't really producing at that point. He built the industry, he built a lot of block apartments, he changed a lot of uh, the big cities and all these investitions in the end, at some point, maybe in the late 70s, they didn't really pay back. So the production wasn't that, uh, you know, uh, the same level of, as the Occidental market. He, could, he did export things, but he did export for cheaper. The products were not really exported to Occidental countries, except for the Romanian car. I think the Dacia one, the Renault one was exported even to Canada at some point. But the exports weren't really paying back that much and he had a lot of loans. And at some point, he realized that those loans were really coming, crashing down on the Romanian economies because we also have interest, right? And that's what happened in the late 10 years of the dictatorship is that he wanted, he had this idea, which is not really normal economically to really 
pay off all the loans and this caused him to stop a lot of imports especially foods but also anything else uh, clothes and anything else and also he started to export food the food that actually was actually meant for the pop people he started to export it to the occident for foreign uh, currency so this completely debalanced the level of life in romania which wasn't already that much high and uh, this didn't really work the entire industry was designed in such way was the he had built really big mastodont uh, industrials industry and also he wanted to produce almost everything in Romania he didn't pay uh, he didn't purchase things from the exterior he wanted the Romania to be like a full um, self um, what's the name for it a country that doesn't need to buy anything from the exterior basically and this is just unrealistic right especially uh, in the middle of uh, occidental countries so the entire economic structure were really was really poorly designed and in the 80s the last 10 years started to really collapse uh, things were just um, there's there's more in, into this more uh, economical detail but things were just uh, starting to go really bad uh, the production started to suffer exports started to suffer and the economy was really collapsing and despite all this and this is the uh, the mind of a dictator you see if you have perhaps old parents or old people around you you will notice that as you get old maybe in your 70s 80s you realize that those people start to kind of degrade their their intellectual abilities and just their their minds start to degrade and his mind started i believe to really go downhill as well that's why you don't keep uh, <clears throat> like biden thinks uh, people 80 years old that's really bad for the uh, for the politics mm. so the guy started actually to in my opinion go crazy and he started projects so in the last 10 years he started to behemoth projects projects that have never seen be seen and um, I, I, I i'll let you compare perhaps in the whole history of the humanity i don't have really full numbers he started this uh, canalization uh, between the black sea and the danube uh, which was a uh, i will let you search on google uh, blue danube canal or something like this by ceausescu search it up and uh, see what uh, what the amount of work that has been done to that project which was really a uh, useless project and you will have a lot of romanians who are going to blame me for saying that because there was a lot of propaganda about that project the, uh, the television and the newspapers during Ceausescu and everybody in Romania now thinks that was really an accomplishment but it was absolutely futile uh, it didn't uh, bring money it didn't uh, actually even pay back uh, but it didn't help there was this kind of um, ship transport transportation on Danube basically it, it reduced the transportation from the Western Europe towards the Black Sea by two days that was insane i mean is is the effort done to do that project you will see just really uh, search on youtube about that project uh the length the 40 kilometers that's about uh, 25 30 miles of length the depth of that uh, project uh, i don't know if how it compares to the panama canal but it was absolutely it, there's no adjectives there's no attribute that i can use for that uh, I think they did dig something like the volume of 20 Cheops pyramids, 20 great pyramids they dig out from that canal. It was some, something absolutely insane. And all this was done with Romanian technology and from a country that was had a uh, collapsing economy. Uh, I just, I'm out of words. There's no, no, nothing you can do. So this is a project that he started around 1980 and finished in 1984 or 85, five years. And one month 
<laughs> the guy was on a rampage, total rampage. That's why you need to really pay attention when you want to vote for a future dictator, if you know he's going to go crazy. Um, one month after uh, opening this project, finishing the project, inauguration, one month by the book, he starts the uh, House of the People project. I don't know how his name now, House of Parliament in the middle of the Bucharest which is one of the biggest buildings in the entire world. Uh, he started this project. I will, I will, I will try to find the video uh, online that, uh, and put in that future video uh, footage about the interiors of this building. There is, again, I cannot find attributes to describe this. The building has, I think, a few hundreds of colossal rooms and corridors. Colossal. You will see maybe if I put that footage, it's the, the, your mind cannot conceive, cannot understand the amount of work of that building, the amount of space. And that building was absolutely useless. There was no way you can um, put, you could put offices in a few rooms, but the rest of the rooms will stay completely, completely empty basically i mean i think even the heated heating of that building is, must must be something insane amount of cost every uh, every winter so so he starts building that building in 85 or so and the building it's almost finished when he got shot uh, when he was killed uh, so this is this is his mind went completely on rampage and this building is not just a big building um, the interior, first off, I think the entire buildings, building was done, the interiors and exteriors as well, uh, was done with Romanian materials. And if you look in that, those footage, you will see that every single interior is covered in marble, from the ceiling to the columns to the floor, marble everywhere. You will see those chandeliers, chandeliers. Ma massive chandeliers, meters wide in almost every interior building in every room. You will see those carpets. Um, those carpets, I think, had to be sealed on place because they were much too big to transport. And I think the only material that was imported was some of those huge doors from I don't know what country, what kind of uh, woods. Uh, so yeah, he went on a rampage when the country was really collapsing and the people were lining up for food. Uh, this this is what insanity does. Uh, let me just finish with uh, one last point about the uh, economy in the communist society. So I was saying one of the reasons, perhaps the main reason why the economy did collapse is because Ceausescu had really... Um, uh, he, he had the control. See, there were situations, some people would report to him, uh, look, that factory, uh, they were doing a car, a Citroen replica at some point. And they say that that, country, uh, that factory, uh, the gearboxes are of poor quality and we cannot produce the car at the assembly line. And he would just give, uh, give uh, orders, do it this way and this way. And I would guess, actually, well, that's why the, those people saying, uh, saying these stories uh, believe uh, these orders were not always good. He, you, you know, you need to know production line, you need to know engineering and so on and so on. So these words were, were not always good, but the people were really afraid of him. So if the director of that uh, factory would just get that kind of order, what would you do at that point? That's a big problem. I mean, you cannot just ignore the order. There's always a security guy in the staff uh, of the uh, factory. You cannot ignore that order and you cannot do that order because it's really going to cause even more production problems. So you see the kind of difficulties that happen. But one of the parts why the economy doesn't work in this kind of communist countries is also because of the workers themselves. So you, you, can, you can imagine workers, they are really tired. They are really pissed off on the dictator, on the entire government. Uh, they have no freedom. They are frustrated. They need to stay in line for food. Their kids are hungry. And you need to go to the factory to work for that communist country. 
that's not very uh, uh, that's not a lot of amount of stimulus to have good workers so this is what happens the workers simply don't care about their work and also the country that's what uh, the system was doing in our country you just cannot get i mean perhaps you can get fired if you do really bad things like steal something or do like a big big mistake but otherwise just because you are lazy you are not going to get fired because the party wants everyone to have not just to have a working place but to work at some place that was absolutely unaccepted to not to have a job just to stay at home even if you had enough money to stay at home so the factory director had to keep that worker that was lazy so you see that it just doesn't work and also on the countryside you have these uh, farmers that they lost their land they lost their animals their live crop the government took them from them and they had to work in a co-op with the same things with their land with their past owned animals and so on so how do you feel about that you just don't feel like going to work right so that's why nothing worked in there it was just dysfunctional at all levels at all levels all right so uh see in the next future video i will talk about that that's uh, quite interesting uh, to see about the levels of fear in the in the country and how we were just aware of the dictatorship in the country how we how the country was keeping us in fear at all levels including the children we had to talk with uh, with parents at home just be instructed not to say this not to do that let's see this in the next video thanks for watching